Thank you all for, uh, for being here today. Um, so I, I suppose the topic that we're given is um, uh, Hong Kong is so well known, uh, having a lot of uh, possible uh, investment classes. So, so let's start off with asking sort of why you want to invest in startups. And let me preface that question by a little bit. Um, I think the general answer is uh, for, um, for most people um, who become successful with venture capitalists, there are probably sort of extrinsic and intrinsic motivations. The extrinsic being sort of being able to get a 10x, 100x, 1000x return possibly on one of your investments. And the other being sort of more intrinsic, um, being passionate about working with entrepreneurs, helping them grow their company and all that. Uh, if I could sort of um, go around the table and ask each one of you to share your personal story of um, sort of, you know, of all the things you could do, why, why are you a venture capitalist and why are you investing in startups? And what's the personal side? Um, you don't mind start sort of, uh, let's see, clockwise. We'll start with Stuart. Sure, thank you, Andrew. Um, I'll, I'll answer your question in those two, two parts. So from a, from a sort of financial standpoint, I think uh, venture capital or startup investing um, you know, relative to other alternative investments, um, I think offer sort of asymmetry in terms of kind of risk return. Uh, you, know, you can have, um, because these investments tend to be very high growth, you know, hyper growth in, in some cases, these are underpinned by kind of technology in most cases. So it's only these type of investments that allow you to have you know, really high growth. And you can measure growth by either kind of users or revenue or even profits, but it's with this growth that drives kind of the value of your investment. And it's hard to find kind of comparable sort of investment profile in, in other uh, investment classes, public or private. And of course, like because of that, you know, uh, the flip side is you can, so you can make you know, multiple, multiple times your money, but at the same time you can downside is, is, is 100%. Um, and so I think most VCs take a more of a portfolio approach and uh, you know, try to invest it across a number of investments in the fund and, and try to kind of manage their win-loss uh, ratio. Um, so that's kind of why investing in, in, in venture is attractive to me. On the personal side, I mean, I would say um, I, uh, I was exposed to Silicon Valley and that's where I started my, my fund. Uh, through uh, my experience at Stanford, I went to Stanford uh, Business School, and through that experience, I learned. You know, like I met a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, and also uh, met some you know, very successful investors. And so through that experience, I felt, you know, that's something I wanted to uh, try myself. And and I met my partners at, at the Stanford GSB, and so through that we founded our uh, VC fund uh, a couple of years ago. Great. Okay. Um, actually, five years ago, I didn't know I wanted to invest in angel uh, startup. Not at all. But what I, what I knew was um, that sometimes I was looking for alternative investment in something other than mutual funds or other than you know, just stocks and other things. So we, I was looking at like, whether I can you know, invest in projects or, or something like that. And the opportunity actually came um, in 2008 when a friend of mine who is a CEO now of a of social and business um, network startup in China. So he asked me whether, whether I can help him to raise funds and whether I would be interested in investing in this company. So I thought, okay, that looks interesting. That may be the things I was looking for in terms of the alternative investment. And it turns out, I then start you know, asking friends on Facebook and emailing some friends I thought would be interested. It turns out that actually a lot of friends are looking for this sort of alternative investment. You have to picture yourself in 2008 in Hong Kong. There weren't many startups, there weren't many angel investors. Uh, for those of you who you know, who know I mean, um, it just, just wasn't quite there in 2008. But I was surprised that I actually found enough friends who thought they were interested in that. And so that, that's, that got me started. And then, and then we thought, well, let's start an angel investment club uh, in Hong Kong. So we got about 30 people who you know, sat down and you know, have dinner and have a, had a great time. And then, but then you soon realize a lot of them are the, you know, you jump, I jump type. So they were looking for someone to look for these deals and do the due diligence, and then, and then yeah, if you invest, then I'll follow you. <laughs> and, and then we thought, well, that, that doesn't quite work, because I'm doing all the hard work, meeting the ventures, the, the entrepreneurs, and then you know, taking time and looking at the business plan, and then you just come along and, and, and invest. So 
Well, I then I then said, well, to some of the friends who um, who who actually responded to you know um, when we sent them a business plan, they actually responded. If we asked to book a time to see the the entrepreneurs or those who responded, we said, okay, let's let's form a smaller group of people. And so the group of thirty became a group of six. But then the six of us were a little bit more serious, and we said, well, not only we're serious, we don't want to just have an investment club. Let's have a company. So that's how we actually started um, Dark Horse. And by the way, we didn't use the name Dark Horse before. Um, I mean, of course, now I, I'm not, I don't bet on horses usually, but Dark Horse is a good name for angel investment because, I mean, you either win, win big or you lose everything. So I think it kind of is you know, in line with the uh, investment we're making. And we, the Chinese name of Dark Horse is actually Bad Lock. But for those who know the story, right, Bad Lock is a person who can really pick you know, the team name, uh, the, the great horses. But we started off with calling ourselves the uh, Asia Angels Alliance, Triple A, you know, AAA. <laughs> I thought that was the right name to have. But then we talked to some mentor who were who, who very, very experienced angel investor, and they said, oh, by the way, we even have an angel as the logo. You know, A, 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 as in like, uh, A is the body, and then the other two, A is the wing. You can, you can picture the logo. And then the, um, the mentor said, you know this doesn't work in China, right? I said, why? Because you die, you, you know, and then you become an angel. <laughs> so, so that wasn't the right thing. So we changed it to Dark Horse on his advice. So we were quite, quite pleased that um, uh, you know, we did. Now, so how, once we discover we have this passion, I mean, it is an alternative investment. We are looking for high return. It's going to be only a small kind of portion of our personal asset. So we are we are we also you know, we look at things that we we understand. Which we, we try not to invest something that we don't understand. But anyway, that's a long long answer to your question. Perfect. Thank you, Dominic. Um, Andrew, what about your story? Sure. Um, I think in in life, doing whatever you're doing has to be. I mean, you have to like it. You have a passion for it, as, as even better. So why did I invest in startup? Or why did I actually start a business to invest in startups? Um, it's actually quite simple. Um, two reasons. First, I want to start a business myself. So I'm actually a startup myself. Um, you know, I've started a fund for slightly over a year now. Secondly, um, I love technology. I've always been involved with technology in my career. And um, and in, in effect, when I left my old job at Alibaba. Um, you know, I went through the thought process of do I want to start a growth equity fund, do I want to go later stage, um, or do I want to go earlier? So, you know, in, in coming in deciding to actually, you know, picking the stage of technology investments, I chose the earlier stage, which is you know angel um, angel stage or what I call the pre series A stage. Uh, it's it's driven by um, myself actually being more opportunistic because I saw there was a big market opportunity for early stage technology investments in China. Um, so in cycling business, I mean, besides being driven by passion and, and you know, liking what are you going to do, uh, you also need to have some business um, judgment in picking the right opportunity or picking the opportunity, opportunity that you think is right. That's why I decided to invest in startup and, um, you know, Amoeba is, we, we focus largely on mainly in China. Um, we're an R&D fund, and uh, why name the fund Amoeba? And I think um, the previous speaker um, touched on some of the key points why I actually named the fund Amoeba. Amoeba, as you know, is a um, you know it's a bug, uh, but um, it's a very you know it's you know some call it a source of life, but Amoeba um, for me defines survival. I mean, it's been around for a very long time, as everyone knows, and it's it, you know it's got changing and adapting to changes. So for me, te early technology investments is about surviving, especially in China, and it's about responding to external internal changes in the, in the fastest possible way. Thanks. Fantastic. I, I never knew that that was sort of your mindset, but uh, it's completely right in the sense that, you know, like iterating, formless, agility, some of the core uh, you know, characteristics of great entrepreneurs. Um, so let's just sort of move on from sort of high level why invest in startups as an asset class to why invest in a, in a particular startup, right? Because that's probably what the audience is most interested in. How do you know, like, 
some of you are probably thinking, some of the entrepreneurs, you know, what can I do to attract good investors? Um, so let me sort of start off by saying I'm assuming um, the audience probably has sort of uh, quite sophisticated, I'm sure, has a basic understanding that you know, in, in picking winners, uh, a few things you have to look at is you know, market, opportunity, team, um, whether there are sort of like competitive advantages that, that the team in particular has, whether it's a technology or whatever. So but let, let's sort of dive a little bit deeper um, into your personal stories. Um, if I could ask each of you to uh, briefly go through, sort of uh, name one company you have in your portfolio, and your experience, sort of why you invested in them. And if you could, uh, sort of name one case where uh, you passed on the deal. But obviously, don't, don't give us the name of the company that you passed on. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, we could, I, could, I suppose we could start the same way. We could start with uh, Stuart and go around all. Um, I guess in terms of uh, uh, a, a, a success story, a successful startup, uh, one example um, you, you alluded to earlier is, is a company called Karma, uh, and that uh, was acquired by Facebook in May of last year, uh, and really is powering what is Facebook gifts uh, right now. And um, I think sort of to hit on some of those key criteria, I would say, um, the team is, is very important. Uh, I met this person, um, the, the founder of the company, the co-founder of the company, while in a business school. He was a classmate of mine. So I knew him three years before we made the investment. So you know, I, I kind of know him as a person uh, and have tracked his uh, uh, sort of um, experience as an entrepreneur before he even founded this company. He, he had sort of success. He had previous successes before. Uh, he also worked with Person. So it's a co-founding team uh, in the past as well. So I like the, the fact that they're, they've had experience working together. Um, so that's sort of the team side. Um, in terms of sort of opportunity, what they do is they allow you to use mobile devices to send kind of virtual gifts to each other. And virtual gifts are not, and there's, and what they're targeting is not kind of virtual currencies or, or kind of stickers or flowers or things like that, but really um, what you can either be either kind of offline items, sorry, online items like you know um, gift certificates, or even things that you can redeem in store, you know, like a Starbucks uh, card, or even things like that a offline retailer will ship to you. But basically, that allows using a mobile device to make gifting a lot easier. And I thought that was a important trend that was starting, and something that you know guys like you know Facebook, which is a you know a social network that was in search of more monetization uh, channels was, was, uh, was, was needing. And so while we invested in this company that could potentially face a lot of challenges from these big guys, can ever, um, that's, I mean, sorry, Facebook can do their same thing themselves, I felt that these guys were smart enough and nimble enough that they can sort of outperform the big guy. And in fact, they developed quick enough that they built the product very quickly and ended up being acquired by Facebook. Because um, one of the key questions of kind of Facebook's IPO was sort of monetization strategy, especially around mobile, um, and so that kind of fit that need quite nicely. Um, I'll just jump forward and tell you about yeah, a, a, a sort of a, a, a company that we passed, and again, without naming names, I think this is a company that did um, food delivery, um, uh, e-commerce. Food delivery uh, website that allows kind of restaurants to uh, to uh, uh, to do um, food delivery and allow customers to place orders online. And so um, this is a U.S. company, and I passed because I felt that the market was was too um, was already uh, being sort of um, uh, uh, covered by a few big players like Grubhub, uh, like Grubhub or like. Uh, Seamless web, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, those are big guys that have a lot more resources. And uh, even though this company was more of a startup and they were trying to do the full um, full uh, uh, solution, so they were even going to sell like a tablet to the restaurants so that you didn't really, the 
restaurants didn't need to have quiet systems to hook up to you know, the, the network. You know, literally all the ordering can be, uh, be shown on a tablet that they would put next to a cashier. But um, I just felt the, 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 the company, I mean, the business was too competitive. Um, there's, there's too much competition. And also the, the, the go-to-market strategy just required too much. There's, there's a hard work component. Um, hopefully that, that, that's uh, great for that. Covers that. That's really useful. Um, and, um, um, and the investment that we did um, was an e-commerce in China where they sell uh, pet accessories and pet food online. And the reason we invested in that one was because from the dark horse often look for co-investor, or, or sometimes we have other angel investors which actually lead the deal. And that was one of these situations. We, we like that because, first of all, you're not the only one that thinks they have a viable business. So someone else also thinks they have a viable business, which is a good sign. And the, the other angel investor is actually, um, uh, it's, a, it's a Simon Murray group, so it's actually very, very, trustworthy and they have a good team. They, they even have more resources than us to do due diligence. So in these circumstances, I mean, um, you know, we, but we, nonetheless, we look at the, the material that they produce, we get to actually meet the team and so on. And at that stage, they, they were doing very well in Beijing. They, they actually tried to approach BC, but the BC said they're too small, you only have Beijing. Come back when you have Shanghai. So we actually invested at the, at the stage where they need to need the capital to expand to Shanghai, and they did. So they did get the VC round eventually, so, which is, is, is good news. So I agree with Stuart, you know, what we invest in is the team. And in this case, they do have track record. They have shown us that they can conquer Beijing. Um, an example for a deal that we passed, I'll give you one simple example. We, we, there was someone who pitched this business plan to us saying that they're gonna do mobile advertising. Uh, you know, um, quite common, you know, a year or two ago, and we, the reason we passed was because they were telling us that they're the only one who's doing it and, and so on. But we have, already, we have already seen four business plans a week before. So we thought they didn't really understand the market, they don't know about their competitor. So that, that just you know, didn't cut it. Andrew. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, I'll, I'll just, I, th I think both um, Stuart and Norman touched on, I think, the key point. If you're in early stage investment, uh, I invest in people. I used to, in, in my old job, I used to invest in you know, public companies, or larger size companies, health insurance, but when you're at the kind of like, you know, series A, pre-series A stages, it's, it's about the people that can, whether they can pull this thing off or not, uh, as long as they're actually addressing uh, a real need, a real, a real problem. So, um, as an example, I mean, uh, I invested in a company called um, Mobujie. It's probably the fastest growing into the company in China last year. And um, why did I invest in them? Um, for, for a few reasons. One, uh, I knew that was a real problem. So what, what did they do? They, they basically the social commerce side, um, where their audience of young, um, you know, I would say just females, uh, between the age of 18 to their late 20s, early 30s, uh, what is the problem? The problem is it's getting harder and harder to find the things that you want on Taobao. And, you know, being in Alibaba, you know, I, I guess I had that inside track knowing what the problem is. So that's why there's a real solution, there's a real problem. Secondly, I know the guy. Um, he used to work at Alibaba, he used to work at Taobao. Had great credentials, great track record. So when I heard that he was, you know, leaving the company and doing his own thing, I immediately looked him up. Um, I, I didn't do a lot of diligence. You know, I knew, I knew what he did before. So he told me, he told me about his idea, told me, uh, showed me uh, his, his, his product, and I said, let's go. Um, so it's a team, it's, a, it's, a, it's the person. Um, now, and, and obviously they, 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 you know, they grown uh, they quite well. I looked at over 400 companies or teams last year. Um, why didn't I? Why did, didn't I? So I made 15 investments so far. Why didn't I invest in the, in the rest of, of, the, of the companies and teams I visited? It's, it's the same reason of what I've said um, in my example of why I invest in more each year. First of all, I don't think some of these people are addressing uh, a real problem. 
even though they're thinking there is a problem, um, or that problem is actually quite small. Secondly, uh, the, the person or the group of um, people uh, in, within the development team, uh, in, my own, in my own views, have high risk of pulling this off, uh, whether it's a reason of basically their experience or their skill sets. So typically, you find um, someone that's doing from an engineering background, technology, very, very, very engineering background, doing something that's, you know, um, or doing a service or doing a product that's very sales driven, consumer driven, whereby, um, you know, having a, prop, uh, a background in product development uh, would actually make uh, that, uh, that, that business even more successful. And conversely, you find a lot of people with a product or more kind of commerce background trying to do something that's very technology driven. So, you know, the, the risk of doing something that maybe you're not capable of, or maybe you don't have the right experience, the right skill set to pull this off, is, is another reason why you know, I pass a lot of this. Instead of giving that an exact example, yeah. Okay, so, so um, to, to synthesize sort of what, what you just said, um, in, in VC circle, we always talk about product market thing, right? You have a great product, you can find a market that actually wants it. So it sounds like what you, you're, you're saying is, all you're saying is, there's also alludes to an earlier question earlier. How do you decide whether someone is investable? Right? So it sounds like what you're getting at is there's also a team product fit. Is this the right team for a particular product? So um, any one of you want to sort of elaborate on that? Like I think Andrew, you did a great job to start. Like um, for example, if you want to challenge Facebook, you certainly would find someone who's uh, you know. Uh, was not exactly in the sort of young, viral, social demographic to do that. I guess I'll just give myself as an example. I mean, um, you know, I went through the, uh, basically, the thought process when I was still at my old job of you know, figuring out what to do if I want to start a business. So, you know, I love technology, I love internet. You know, obviously I thought about Signing an internet company myself or a technology company myself, but um, you know, given my age and also my skill sets, um, I was thinking, you know, if I go pitch an investor, what would they think? So, you know, given my background, what I've done over the last you know, 10, 15 years, a lot of that's actually in finance driven. And which comes to today, I mean, why did my investors give me the money to manage? Because they think Andrew, I think you can probably do a decent job at this. Whereas, hey Andrew, you're actually starting a product that's you know, a mobile app, that's a dating app. <laughs> Andrew, what are you thinking? Do you really want to leave Alibaba to do this? <laughs> <laughs> so, I think, um, obviously, I mean, you know, you see examples of people pulling off great achievements, whereby their background, their experience don't match, but um, that's one in a million. Um, whereas, and I, and I think a lot of that, um, in those instances, I think comes down to a few things. First of all, uh, they really believe in what they're doing. And secondly, they have great execution in pulling that thing off. Whereas for most people, I think, you know, if, if, if you believe in something and you, know, you have the basically low-hanging low -hanging resources to, to pull this off from a you know, risk-reward basis, this is probably the best thing best opportunity to pursue. So when I evaluate investments, uh, I tend to think on those lines. I actually spend a lot of time on understanding why do they want to do this thing that they're trying to do, and do on that. Um, finding out the second reason, so what are the real motivations in wanting to leave that company or you know, wanting to start this product or wanting to do these services? You know, what kind of, I guess, work do you do? spend? What kind of time do you actually spend? Evaluating this opportunity that you can't do, rather than you know uh, what do you think your revenues are next year, what is the P&L, etc. Yeah, anything you want to add for the other two minutes, or should we move on? I just want to add. I, I think this is where you know investing in something you understand becomes important um, because otherwise you can't tell whether the team can deliver. You, you need to at least understand a little bit on the industry, a little bit on the business model, and you you have some gut feel about the market. 
and the implication of the business model, then you can say, okay, I think this team has a good fit. So um, in, in just if I may draw, draw on the dark horse example, because there's six of us, and so we can cover a wider range. But if, if we get a business plan, you know, someone sent us a business plan, we'll pass it around to the partners, and then if none of us say we can, we can champion this, then we'll pass. Very nice. Okay, so, so um, let's sort of take this one step further, right? So we've talked about why invest in startups as an asset class, and then we talked about why invest in a particular company. Let's sort of get even more local in a sense that um, why invest in a particular company from Hong Kong? And um, I'll give the panelists a little bit of time to think as well, because I know, I didn't, I, I, none of the questions were, were prepped earlier, so uh, it's, a, it's a tough question. Um, so uh, while I sort of introduce this topic a little bit, you know, start thinking if you could. Um, so we all know that Hong Kong has some sort of unique competitive advantages in greater China. Right. And um, some companies have been very successful to harness that, like offline, like such as Sasa, which you know a lot of their clientele is uh, mainland Chinese who come here to, to buy cosmetics they trust, for example. And um, on top of that, I want to add, um, I was a judge of Startup Weekend uh, last Sunday, and I noticed a lot of the startups they do these presentations, and then at the end of the slide, they say, these are our revenue projections. And the best case revenue projection they have is, for example, 10 million Hong Kong dollars a year revenue. And quite frankly, I'm assuming if all you're thinking is that's your maximum market size, why raise institutional money, right? So um, let me further scope this by saying there are many industries where Hong Kong can have an impact in greater China, aside from here. Um, you know, whether it's finance, like crowdsource funding, or virtual currency, Bitcoin, uh, fashion, lifestyle, other stuff. But imagine you can sort of find, imagine you can sort of wish into existence an entrepreneur that wants to do something in Hong Kong that sort of takes advantage of its local context. Um, if you could sort of give me a contour, maybe not specifics, but a shape of what would be really investable in Hong Kong that could scale out. Um. Actually, okay. let, me, let me talk about um, what you need to do, let's just start with. Great, I, great. I have to say, for, for the investment we make since 2008, none of the money in Hong Kong, unfortunately. Um, we make investment in Singapore and, and China, but there's a reason for that. It, it, it is hard. I mean, um, it, as you just mentioned, if you see a startup saying that the revenue is going to be like 10 million, that's even even if you can conquer the entire Hong Kong, that's too possibly too small for for investor to get a decent return, or at least not the type of return that investors are looking for. So you you up with the challenge that you must scale beyond Hong Kong somehow. Whether whether you scale to English speaking world, so overseas in a big big market or you scale, somehow you can enter China as well. But then, yes, for those who grew up in Hong Kong like myself, you, you know we don't understand China, but not properly anyway. So, so for someone just from Hong Kong saying they want to conquer China, it's difficult. So unless you have the right partner, you have someone who knows China, I mean, this is a must, right? So, so it becomes very difficult to convince the investor that you can actually expand your business beyond Hong Kong. And, and that's a, a big barrier at, 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 at the moment. Um, what I also found is sometimes we, we have a lot of startups coming to us and they, they cannot distinguish between angels who are investing in something very, very scalable versus something that's not actually scalable, but it's still a good business to have like one shop or two shops or three shops. Um, so, so these are the key, you know, key obstacles I, I see in Hong Kong, the scalability. I'd say um, I'd say the source of capital is also maybe a um, maybe a challenge yet an, an opportunity as well, right? Because the, 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 the funding environment is not as sort of well developed as say you know the entrepreneurial network in China or, or even obviously this versus Silicon Valley. Um, you have but you have a lot of what you know you have a lot of investors here that are not sort of uh, 
their experience investing in sort of startups. And so that, that you know, is an opportunity as well uh, on the flip side, right? Because you, um, there may be a lot of capital, but there aren't a lot of sort of risk capital, uh, people that are willing to kind of invest for, for risk. And so if you are, if you have, you know, a good, good eye for opportunities and you find them, uh, and you can, you are a sort of experienced and resourceful investor, um, you, you can, you know, you don't have a sort of a sourcing problem uh, or origination problem in terms of deal flow that, that you might see elsewhere, like Silicon Valley. You know, Silicon Valley is extremely hard to, to find. There may be a lot of good companies, but it's also very competitive for investors to invest. So, so I think Hong Kong, it could be an opportunity as well. Yeah, I think, uh, I don't think we want to make it sound like, you know, it's kind of like mission impossible to build a startup in Hong Kong. It's not so, and, and really my, my, my head up to you know, a lot of you out here today that's actually doing a startup in Hong Kong. Um, you know, if you can conquer this market or conquer the kind of like, you know, tough parameters that you face, I think, you know, your, your chance of being successful is, uh, is even higher compared to the other players in other markets. And, you know, I've been involved in the startup community for around 15 months in Hong Kong. Um, you know, I've, I've personally seen it you know, grow in terms of the velocity as well as the community over the last 15 months. Um, thanks to you know, folks like Akun supporting the community. Um, I think Hong Kong started to see a very early stage because of the two inherent problems, which you know, both Dominic and Andrew have addressed, you know, market size and capital. Um, I don't think market size has been, it is an issue, but it is not a critical issue. Uh, I think as the community grows and matures, and there's more success stories coming up from Hong Kong, the capital will come. Investors are, you know, they're, they're a bit of a sheep. Um, although they're risk investors, I'm not, I'm not saying, obviously we're different. Um, <laughs> although, although, although they take risk, but they're also very risk averse. So as, as Dominic said, I mean, you know, um, if there's a group of investors out there that wants to invest in this deal, I'll follow. So you can see the kind of mentality facing uh, a lot of the East Asian investors out there. Uh, of the 15 investors that I have, I actually do have one Hong Kong based company uh, in one of my earlier investments. They're doing pretty well. Um, now, why did I invest in these guys? Um, because, first of all, I thought, you know, from a product standpoint, they're doing something that's, um, that's innovative. Solve the real solution, uh, real, real problem. So what they do is they're a technology, uh, they're, they're a social, uh, social marketing firm, um, you know. And obviously, when it, when it came to convincing my, uh, myself in terms of the, uh, the scale issue, uh, you know, I thought something like this can be basically imported in China, and with our help, we can help them do that. Uh, but not every single part or service can be imported into China. So that's what I want to emphasize as well. Um, so when, when you're actually out there um, meeting folks, meeting potential investors, um, I agree with Dominic, don't, don't say, you know, this was so close to China. Um, that's an immediate um, potential market because, as we all know, that's two different markets, two different environments, two, two different set of challenges. One thing I, I personally believe Hong Kong startups, uh, one, of, um, one of the few things, the other things that I'm not aware of, maybe, uh, is mobile because, um, you know, mobility, I think, in, in, in Hong Kong uh, is ahead in terms of other countries, in terms of technology, uh, uh, technology development, uh, also in terms of users, basically, um, acceptance. So, and, and, you know, mobile, you can scale anywhere. It solves a lot of the scaling issues that, that other businesses um, have. And, you know, I think um, that's one area which, uh, you know, Hong Kong startups or Hong Kong based startups can do very well. Great. Um, we have three minutes left, so, so if I could, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead, ask, ask a question. Or are you, you don't have a question to ask? I have a question. Okay, good. Okay. Do you have, um, okay, um, why don't we, yeah, so someone wrote this question for us. So if you could, um, if, you wrote, if you write yours, uh, yours will be the second question. Um, so this first question is, 
do you have an expected yield rate? If you do, how do you decide and or calculate it? Well, because of time reasons, let's just have one of the judges volunteer, um, panelists volunteer to answer the question. So do you have an expected yield rate, some kind of an IRR? I suppose not, right? No, no, I suppose not. So let's move on to the second question. Uh, <laughs> a really long question, all right. Um, okay, let's, let's skip the first question um, because of time reasons. Um, second weird question is, how much could you invest in micro credit venture for charity purpose? So this is, so I suppose it's kind of like Kiva, like Kiva for Greater China, right? Um, is it a fun fun uh, who, who, who wrote this question? Please raise your hand because if, if you don't have the guts to, to raise your hand, how are you going to expect people to give you money? <laughs> so, okay, well, um, third question, I suppose. So, this, this probably has to be the final question because we're running short of time. Oh, okay, two more. It's your call. Um, how can you identify a startup with high growth opportunity? What element do you consider most? Uh, one of the three panelists volunteer. Sorry, question again is how do you identify a startup with high growth opportunity? What element do you consider most? So let, let, me, let me rephrase that question. Um, by definition, you want to invest in startups that are high growth. So which element is most important? Market, people, um, there are two, a couple of different camps. So I think Mark Andreessen said he prefers people. Some others say market, anyone? Uh, I'll keep it short and maybe you guys can chime in. I'd say that the, you know, the, size, the potential size of the market is pretty important and, and, and uh, sort of your positioning inside the market, right? Are you a kind of first or early mover so that you're not faced with a lot of competition grow your business quickly and, and sort of develop modes around your business. At the same time, I think, so I would say, uh, how do you identify kind of these startups with high growth potential? I think it's when you see a trend that is meaningful and sort of sustainable, and you're at the early sort of beginnings of that, of that, of that trend or that theme, and so you, you want to invest in those startups at that time. Um, but not, not the flip side is you don't want to be too early uh, in seeing some of these trends. Putting the team aside, team always first, so they're, they're the execution. <clears throat> so the, the market size, I always have this mental map of the two by two matrix. You know, is it a new solution, new market, or is it an old solution, old market, or new solution, old market, or, or, or old solution, new market? <laughs> so so you, if you are a new, new solution, new market, <clears throat> then you are the innovator, right? You're really starting something completely new and it's going to be ventured into a new market. Like uh, I don't know, <clears throat> uh, like PC in the, in the old days, right? When the first personal computer came out, who who would predict that it would become such a huge market, right? Nobody knows. But certainly, I don't want to invest something in the old market with an old product. That even if you can scale, that means you're just competing for market share. So for the market size question, I need something that is you know, probably a new solution in the old market or a new solution in the new market. That would probably give me a scalable business. Is there anything you want to add? No, I, I just think, you know, I'm, I'm, I think we all are in the business of investing in innovation, whether it's small or big. So a lot of times you actually don't know the growth is coming from. Um, and I, I, for me, I learned a lot about what's happening in the industry from the startup guys, from the founders of people themselves. And I think you, if you're thinking about doing something, uh, you should generally have that knowledge yourself. So for me, at the end of the day, I think I'm, I'm in the and recent camp is about whether you can pull it off or not. <laughs> great, great. So um, due to time constraints, um, well, um, um, yeah, let's skip these questions. And if you really have these questions, you know, Talk to, go up to these people, shake your hand, give your business card, talk to them, ask them about these answers. 
Um, so um, to that, let me sort of wrap up with 30 seconds. Um, thank you for, uh, for the three panelists for being here today to share your insight. And uh, thanks to Kakuit for organizing them, this event. Um, well, let's move on to the next uh, panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.